of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We're joined by Rowan Bailey, who's currently Head of Revenue Operations at Pecom. Hello. Um, <laughs> hello, hello, Rowan. And was previously in both sales and sales operations at Perkbox. So we have a salesperson in our midst. <laughs> or not. Met. Maybe I read that one. I'll run on your LinkedIn. So yeah, it was an account um, manager role. So it was it was it was post sale, but um, definitely okay. definitely lived and breathed next to the salespeople at that company. So yeah. Did you have a Did you have a quota? Um, ish. Um, we okay. had the portfolio value that we had to bring back. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was a bit more freeform than that. But yeah. Got it. Okay. So not like out and out sales, but kind of almost fair. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was, a, it, was a, it was a retention and uh, land expand sort of model. Got it. Okay, cool. So let's, this is an interesting transition, right? Because within Perkbox, you went from account manager into sales operations. So that's, that's right. Cool. So could you just talk a bit more about kind of why and how you made that, that jump? Yeah, sure. So uh, Perkbox um, employee benefits platform, I uh, joined it in 2015. And it was around 30 people at the time, a uh, bit of a rocket ship at, at that time. It was like really kicking off. Um, by the time I left, two years later, it was 180 people just to get even oh, like, wow. an idea of the, the growth. Um, yeah. And then my transition into ops kind of s happened quite organically. Like I started um, mainly out of necessity, uh, trying to migrate my processes off of spreadsheets, which the whole company seems to run at the time. Mm. Um, and then as a result of that, I mean, the rest of the company just started looking over and being like, hey, how come is how come you've done all that stuff so quickly? Like, what are you using to do that? And I'm like, well, the tools that are already at your disposal, do you mind coming over and uh, showing me how to do that? <laughs> so what, what started off as smoothing out processes um, and kind of data input for the account managers quickly became redesigned the whole sales process and integrate Salesforce with finance and that sort of thing to, to kind of smooth mm. along uh, collections by direct debit and invoicing. So it it was organic makes it sound quite pedestrian. It was it was still kind of progressing at a rate of knots and uh, the workload was huge, especially as my own team at that time was growing. Uh, by the time I moved away from that position to focus solely on ops, I was looking after a team of, uh, of nine, I think, uh, at that point. So looking after their own portfolios of say like a million ARR each, uh, and then um, dealing with the ops stuff as well, as you can imagine, was, was a lot to take on. Um, so I was quite happy when my boss at the time, the COO said, do you want to just focus on this 100% uh, of the time? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. <laughs> so when you joined, were you you weren't managing account managers. You were actually an account manager. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you progressed to managing account managers, and that's when this you, you started doing the ops work, and then you switched out. Is that right? Yeah, it was quite good for um, in terms of how I then started to approach problems. Where, what started as how can I make this easier from a purely selfish perspective um, was right. What's scalable, what's repeatable, what works for the rest of the team. Um, and then, you know, it was quite an easy sell after that to be like, do you know how we do it now? It takes half an hour to, to fill out, you know, a few columns on the spreadsheet, a couple of clicks and you're done. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that was kind of how that progressed. Got it. And do you think that there's something like, why do you think you gravitated or what is it within you? And it's kind of a deep question early on in the interview. What was it within you that gravitated more to the operational side rather than just managing more account managers? It is a good question. Um, I think my just inherent repulsion for, for being bored and, and that, that is something that comes up when I have to do a job more than once, the same thing more than once. I'm just like, okay, I know how this works now, done. Um, so maybe it is a, a kind of a drive to find out how things work at their nitty gritty sure. and then try and build stuff that uh, automates that for you. Cool. Um, and then moving on to PCON today. So talk to me about revenue operations. Okay. Uh, in what <laughs> sense? <laughs> so we've had ever since the start of this podcast, which is, as everyone knows, called sales ops demystified. We've had people saying that actually sales ops is just one piece in a 
tri trimester uh, tri operations factor. department trifecta, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and and so I, I like to kind of run that past you because it seems like you're running a more integrated operations team. Yeah, uh, that's that's the plan. It's it was revenue operations in title only to begin with. Um, as Pcom was growing, the focus naturally is on sales and that machine getting getting that ticking over. Um, but the vision was there from the start, which is nice to um, to incorporate, you know, the top of funnel marketing work and also then post sale retention, um, which is the cornerstone of any you know ARR SaaS business. Um, so that was there from the beginning, and right now, currently building out the team. So we've got someone focused uh, just on the sales ops side, and we're hiring currently for CS ops uh, role to look at that post sale. Actually, I feel a bit bad. Like CS have been a bit not neglected, but um, you know they've taken the back seat as we've been scaling the business over the last few years. And now, uh, not that we have a problem there or anything, it's more preventative and it feels quite nice to take a proactive step for once mm -hmm. um but yeah you're right having that integrated team that sit across uh the tech stack specifically and making sure that data is flowing from department to department as it should without getting too siloed or too caught up in the flavor of the month stuff that comes from managers within those within those tiers um that's quite nice and it's quite a nice position to be to be in as a ops professional to say no, actually, I, I can see your need for that, but please understand that this has to take priority now. And having that impartiality um, is quite nice, and I think is quite well respected actually at Pecon as well. Got it. Um, so, can you quickly give us a taste for the numbers of people within that operations team, and then I guess we don't need or like and rough numbers for the marketing sales and customer success team, just so we can understand the. The yeah, build up. Yeah. yeah, sure. So um, until last Monday, there were two of us in the operations team. Hey. Um, and that's myself and Bart. Um, mm -hmm. I hired Bart last September, and he's come in as a revenue systems engineer, I believe his title is now. Um, he codes in Apex and builds stuff out in Salesforce that's kind of custom for us, uh, mm -hmm. avoiding actually twice now he's he's helped us avoid quite a hefty um, bill from Salesforce for additional functionality that they provide in a different product but actually we just needed a simplified version of said product and he's been yeah. that stuff out and um, so he joined in September uh, Arda joined last Monday and like I said we're hiring another one hopefully for a start date of around October this year um, and that is servicing the company's just gone just crossed the 200 mark I think and I joined when it was about 38 ish wow um so quite a lean team i would say mm -hmm. um so that's yeah it's, it's had its challenges but it's also been quite good because we've known everything so intimately and it's forced us to build for scale it's like our number one principle like if it's mm -hmm. a flavor of the month um kind of problem or topic that comes up like we really ask three questions, you know, the three whys or whatever, to drill down and say, is this actually necessary? Will it still be relevant in, in six months, one year's time? Um, so the sales team right now, I think we're about 60-ish salespeople, CS, maybe 20. Um, and then there's a lot of product people here in Copenhagen where I'm currently sat. Cool. And the marketing team, just roughly? Let's say 25, 30. I should know that. But, uh, no, it's fine. Actually, no, um, it's a complete lie. It's, it's far smaller than that. Um, I know because I was in a room with them drinking cocktails last Friday. So <laughs> I should, uh, should know that. Maybe like 15, cool. 15, 20. Yeah. So that, is a, um, that is a lean operations team. I, I try to get the ratio from every mm -hmm. guest. And I think the average is between one ops person per 15 to 20 uh, reps. So That's four, interesting. It seems like you are significantly high well you're right. well i'll use that as a as a pitch to get more <laughs> headcount budget but actually yeah, uh, it's an interesting point um i don't think that the ops team should scale linearly with the company at all mm. if you're if you're building an efficient ops team that's concentrating on the right problems focusing in on those you know the real levers that are going to drive that growth then actually your headcount should be um spaced out by, I don't know, I don't know what the, the mathematical term would be, but as a, as a function of, of uh, headcount in the business, you know, 
say you, you make your first hire after 30 people and your next one after 60 people, you should make your next one after 150 people, for example. Um, yeah. That makes sense to me and it shows that the team is efficient and working on the right problems. Um, there's another school of thought which would say that there's only so many hours in a day and so many problems that you could be working on in order to accelerate growth. Um, so maybe adding headcounts to the pile is an answer to that. I'm kind of on the fence on that argument. Nice. Um, can we quickly review the current sales tech stack at Pecon? Yeah, sure. So I was quite lucky in the sense that um, the C-level or the co-founder's attitude towards buying tech is, first of all, very positive. They, they see the value in, in adding tech to the stack. Um, I came in, for example, with Salesforce already in place, built out using standard objects, um, as five stages on the opportunity. Like, you know, it was a dream compared to some of the horror stories you hear uh, ups people having to inherit um, in, in companies that they join. Um, yeah, our co founder, for example, got Salesforce in when there was only two salespeople, I think, which at that stage is, is mm. quite uncommon, I think. Um, but his, his reasoning for doing so was saying, right, as we scale, Salesforce is going to be at the core of our sales operation. If we want that to be the best in class product and we can't afford to scrimp, uh, to save, sorry, that's not the word, spend extra money, like at 60, 70, 100 extra dollars a month, then we've got bigger problems than the CRM that we're using, um, which I quite liked because it meant that my job was a lot easier. So we've got Salesforce at the core. Uh, we use Marketo for our marketing automation, Sales Loft for outreach for the SDR team. Um, we've got a tool called Chili Piper, which I'm a fan of, and anyone from Pecon knows that I'm kind of evangelist for that product. Um, meeting, booking, and also lead assignment through round robin queues is quite quite a nifty thing. We use New Voice Media for making calls. Uh, what else have we got? We've got basically a tool for every occasion. I'm actually trying to consolidate a little bit and and cut some of the chaff out. My problem with some of those tools is is the fact that there are overlapping functionality. And as soon as you have that in in a sales team, it's very easy for a salesperson to start coming up with their own processes. You know, uh, I'm gonna run my cadences from this uh, lead enrichment tool rather than sales lot, for example, where the team cadences lie. And then you end up with this situation where you've got different people doing different things, you try and make a change. Some people love it. Other people are like, what the hell is that? So it, it's the recipe for chaos uh, unless you kind of stamp it out quite early. So you're saying that if a product had, say, three functionalities and you already had products covering the other two, would that go against it in, its buy, in the buying cycle for that product? It's a good question. Um, I think the lack of flexibility around which elements of the product we can and can't use, definitely. And I've, I've made made or not made buying decisions based on that before um, because I could anticipate the level of chaos it would have brought into the sales team. Got it. And on that topic, um, I want to talk more about how you interact with sales rep, whether that was back at Perkbox or here at Peepon. Um How were you able to get a salesperson to do something that maybe they didn't want to do because it wasn't directly associated with their goals <laughs> but you wanted them to do it to do with work right to do with work. <laughs> um is involving sales reps at every stage of of that thought process and buying cycle actually i'm going to rewind not every stage you can do the short list and i think ops people should be in charge of the short list but once you've got say your two three tools that you're trying to consider to implement for example involving them in that decision making process and and running past uh, say like a trial phase um letting them impact the user experience specifically massively helps when it comes to adoption because once i'm presenting it to the to the whole team it's like well actually you've already got validation from your peers um they've been involved in shaping this process um, if you don't like it, then you have a problem with them as well as me. You know, it's it's less ops versus sales, and yeah. you've got that collaboration kind of there from the off. Um, that's I, I'm talking completely idealistically here. Like I, I've m not done that uh, fairly recently, and it's 
it's come back to bite me. So it's a lesson recently learned. Um, and actually, when I look back, the times when I have done that versus the times I haven't, adoption um, and that kind of lack of friction has always been there. Got it. I really like that, just that term, it's less ops versus sales, but actually it can be more sales versus sales if you get the right people <laughs> on, your, on your team. Yeah, and um, actually picking your champions for that team is, is quite important. Um, it's, mm -hmm. It's less about picking the people that you would assume to be champions and more making champions of the people that would probably give you the biggest fuss if you just rolled it out without telling them. The detractors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you can turn a detractor into at least a neutral, then you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Um, and then you have obviously, in both of your roles, seen sales team scale. Any tips for onboarding, for efficient and effective onboarding? Um, so honestly, our onboarding process needs work. I think it is a symptom of, of the fast growth. Like as soon as you tr start to try and standardize your onboarding process with processes and tools that are in a constant state of flux and, you know, you might make a, a lovely presentation and a great onboarding video, but if it's irrelevant two weeks later, it's like, ouch, okay, I'm not, I don't want to have to keep making this video every two weeks. Um, we're currently in a position now where we're, we've stabled out a little bit and in terms of our processes and there are some parts of that onboarding journey that I'm looking to to kind of, you know, just have as a non-recurring meeting in my calendar and have it as a as a video or something like that that they can join instead. Um, we've just invested in a tool called Showpad, um, which is quite good at building out these um, kind of custom courses and that sort of thing. So you can add, say, a training video, then you know a pdf to read and then a quiz basically a comprehension quiz at the end to see if they've understood everything so yeah i'm going to be leaning on that quite heavily to to put my onboarding experience into specific paths and specific courses got it um and then making teams or sales reps specifically more productive do you have any wisdom to share um it's tricky um I think for us, we're, we're reviewing the, the SPIF, the concept of the SPIF, especially at the SDR level, where some of the um, some of the work that they're doing is quite repetitive and not in and of itself inspiring to them. So you have to kind of add that level of, uh, of inspiration for them. So we're, we're building out this thing called hustle points at the moment and any outbound activity, outbound meetings, conversations, that kind of thing are all scored differently um, and provide a leaderboard, weekly incentives, that sort of thing. Um, hopefully that shouldn't be uh, that revolutionary to anyone. Um, mm -hmm. Using Showpad as a, as a means for getting knowledge out of reps' heads and basically I think that the result of that is you end up with reps unconsciously benchmarking themselves against their peers in a way that they don't do unless they overhear a conversation across the room, for example. So actually tapping into the competitive instinct of salespeople in order to drive their own learning and their own productivity is quite a nice way of doing it. And that's what the SPIF does. And it's also what, um, you know, having this situation where we've got everyone's best pitch in one place, for example. Got it. So you're actually having salespeople upload content into Showpad as training materials for other salespeople. Exactly. And and the nice thing about that is 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 twofold, right? So you've got the the pitches there for reps to compare themselves against and actually borrow best the best bits from each and actually update their own pitch. And I think we, we've only run it through once, but the second iteration is gonna be really interesting uh, to see the kind of osmosis of of ideas between pitches. Um and then the second thing is we've got a massive repository of everyone's best pitch for onboarding, right? As it, it feeds back into that really nicely when you've got a new starter and it's like, well, actually go and listen to everyone in the business, including the CRO's pitch. You will learn very quickly how to talk about Pecon in a, in a very short period of time. Cool. Um, we also, there's one more thing, actually, I just looked at my notes. Um, win analysis and loss analysis. Like there, there's something that we had in Salesforce um, from pretty much the start, like, can you write a small paragraph about exactly why we won this deal? What would you have done differently? Um, what would you do next time? That kind of thing. 
And the game changer for us was actually putting that into Slack. So every time they win a deal or close lost an opportunity, you end up with that analysis attached to it. And we saw the quality of those go up. I can't even put a number against it, like a hundredfold, rather than uh, lead gone cold or opportunity gone cold mm. will pick up next year. It's like, oh, actually, what did you try? What what resounded well with them? What didn't? Um, that sort of thing. So that's a good way of also sharing sharing the learnings, um, not just in the celebrate, celebratory moments, but when things aren't going so well as well. That's nice. So we currently show one and lost in Slack, but we don't include any of the custom fields. So that's actually something that we're going to take away. Very nice. Um, can we quickly go over forecasting? So how involved are you in the sales forecast? So forecasting is something that has been under the microscope at Pecon for the last few months. Um, a few months ago, we moved everyone over to using the standard functionality in Salesforce, the, the forecasting app, having quotas in there, having one, everyone kind of update their, their best case pipeline and commit deals for the month. Um, there's a layer that's missing, and that's the kind of the judgment call. Um, sure, you've got four deals in best case, but what's your actual pledge number, what, what are you actually going to bring in? Um, rather than being opportunity driven, being that top down rep gut feel side of it. Yeah. Um, so on the plus side, SDs, the CRO, everyone now looks at that forecasting app. We take a screenshot of it every Monday for our revenue meeting. So the whole, the whole sales team is singing from the same hymn sheet, which is nice. Um, and we've now got a deal review process in place with reps so that Every Wednesday, they have an hour blocked out to go through their ops, make sure they're in the right stage, the right amount, and they're making the right call against that. And close date, obviously, that's important. Um, so everything's improving, but we're still looking at third-party tools to uh, bring that extra element and that extra layer over the top of our forecasting. Um, so I think Clary was one we're reviewing. Um, yeah, there's there's a few out there that, that we're having a look, look at at the moment. So... Are you as the ops team responsible for making sure that data is useful and accurate? That's your role in the process. It's my role to make it incredibly transparent when those things aren't up to date. So things like how long has this opportunity been in that stage? Um, you know, what's the health of this opportunity? We have like this kind of smiley face system. Uh, it's very, very advanced. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, that basically shows if it's been in the current stage for longer than the average close one deal and whether or not the next steps are in the future and up to date. Then it's very much process driven from the sales directors and uh, other sales managers to say, right, what's the quality of those next steps? Why is that next step in two weeks and not tomorrow? Like it, there's the coaching piece that comes around it. Um, and that all kind of feeds into the forecasting. Got it. We have a question here from Zach. Um, how do you keep KPIs aligned with unforeseen data capture? Now, I'm not really sure what Zach means by that. Zach, if you could clarify, uh, Rowan, I'm not sure if that makes sense to you. Un unforeseen data capture is sounds scary. <laughs> okay, Zach, can you clarify? We're going to quickly move on. Um, you're probably going to have about five minutes to clarify that question. Uh, cool. Next, let's talk about KPIs. Um, what do you think is, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, the, the most, throughout your career in operations, the most useful or insightful sales-related KPI? <laughs> uh... I have, I probably, it's, it's quite high level, but I have to go with win rate. It's it's all very well and good celebrating a rep, smashing their quota and, you know, high-fiving through the office. But if they have crashed and burned uh, a mountain of opportunities to get to where they are and, and, you know, raise themselves up that way, then actually that's not good for business, not good for, for uh, the rest of the team if they cotton on that that's the way that that person made that much money by cherry picking ops to that degree. Um, so for me, like win rate is, is super important. And just to clarify, 
I mean, I, I know I've heard win rate calculated in different ways at different companies. So, so for me, it's um, the value of closed one opportunities versus all closed lost opportunities in a given period. Um, and for us, we don't take the reps closed lost value. We have a model that assigns a fair value to an opportunity based mm -hmm. off of previously closed one opportunities of set of uh, similar characteristics. So um, certain size, certain location, that sort of thing. Um, and that's a model that looks at the last 180 days and kind of keeps refreshing itself as we go along. So therefore, we've got a stable baseline for comparison for the win rate. And that's why I trust it so much. Um, there's another angle on that, though, which is the interplay between the acceptance rate of an opportunity and a win rate. So if the SDRs are booking 100 meetings, but only 20 of them are getting accepted um, into actual live pipeline, then you expect your win rate to be 100%. So the, the balance between those two is something that I'm particularly interested in. And I haven't cracked it yet, but I'm, I'm, I keep a close eye on it and try and model out what a change in one will do to the other and what's good and what's bad. Got it. So you're saying that a salesperson could gain their win, win rate by having low acceptance? Yes, absolutely. If I only accept one opportunity and they've already told me on the phone that they love it so much and they want to buy it, then mm -hmm. you're going to have a win rate of 100%. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a balancing act between those two. And you shouldn't look at one without the other, really. Got it. Um, Zach's back. Zach's back. Can you see that? So how do you leverage your data? And do you have a way of knowing what you need to drive the business forward? And again, that sounds quite vague, but right on over to you. Um, OK, so I think, I, I guess how I'll answer that is you've got to decide what your non-negotiables are. And and that's a, a phrase borrowed from our CRO. It's, it's about what, what do I need to know as, as an ops guy in order to make decent decisions and to identify where the problems are in the funnel. So for me, and we've just talked about one of them, right? Like the acceptance rate from SQL for us to SAO, um, that's huge. And I, I need that in place in order to make the decisions I make. Anything else, the data capture that comes around that, um, first of all, we have to ask, is it going to be relevant in a month's time, in six months' time, in a year's time? If yes, then are you actually going to do anything with this data? It might be great, and you might see the value of like theoretically capturing this data. Um, but if you're not planning on doing any analysis that involves that data point, then don't bother. Like It's just extra admin for the reps, and they hate that. So uh, try and keep your process as, as clean as possible. Um, I, think, I feel like I veered away from his question slightly, but... Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think it would be quite hard not to be away from it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Zach, it was a great question. Um, finally, who has taught you the most about sales operations? It's an interesting one because I'm, I'm actually quite new to the uh, sales ops group in London and already I've learned a lot and, and just by listening to your podcast and a couple of other operations podcasts as well. Um, so there's that side that I'm kind of nurturing now. But I'm still kind of finding my feet in that world. Um, but thank you very much for having me on. It's, it's been great fun so far. Um, I think really the, the people that empowered me to kind of follow the ops route have been, I've been very fortunate to have two good managers. Um, the CEO at, at Perkbox, Gautam Sagal, he's, he was fantastic in, in basically pointing me at an interesting problem and then stepping back and being like, what do you think? Like, how, how would you solve this? Or, or how could Salesforce solve this? Or, you know, is there a tool out there that can, that can help us get around this problem? Um, and that kind of laid the groundwork for me thinking like that about every problem. Um, and that's kind of led to where I am today. So yeah, definitely. He's a, a big role model. Um, and then Dan, our, our, one of our co-founders here as our CMO, He's very similar in that um, highly analytical, but he's got a very high bullshit filter as well, which is great um, for me. So I'll go to him and be like, oh, I've got these numbers. You know, it's kind of what they look like. He'd be like, mm, OK, what about if this was the case? And be like, OK, I'll go back to the drawing board and, and reanalyze. So yeah, both of those, those characters have been uh, instrumental in 
where I am today. Got it. Now let me share some of the things I like from today. Um, I've never heard this before about how revenue operations can help you avoid flavor of the month projects within this siloed revenue generating op op operations. Um, building for scale, like that being a criteria for anything that you're looking to implement. Um, the whole, I mean, I'd be interested if you develop the algorithm for, or the formula for the amount that an ops team should scale with a sales team. Um, yeah, me too. I agree. I'm not sure if it should be linear. And, my, and what I've been doing on this podcast has been asking and then assuming linear growth. Um, less ops versus sales when you're trying to influence or get people to buy into a process and actually you can do sales versus sales if you get the right people on your side and then yeah having sales people uploading their own content into the into any repository so they can benchmark each other and get competitive i think is awesome as well so rowan that was really really good thank you so much for your time and thank thanks you. Yeah, it's been great. They were really comprehensive notes. I didn't even see you writing. That was that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. And take care.